Spirit interrupt the message that I had planned, and uh, we went off script. And I think it was a timely message that the Lord wanted us to hear in regards to our worship. And what the Lord is looking for out of us is, is true worship, worship in the Spirit and in the truth. Uh, but today I want us to return to our uh, uh, mini-series here, and actually I want us to conclude it here uh, this morning. I want to wrap everything up that we've been building upon over the last uh, uh, five or six weeks or so. Uh, now, uh, what we've been looking at are some keys to uh, unlock a positive self-esteem. Uh, I've got a little bit of feedback up here, Josh. Uh, and if you'll remember, uh, two weeks ago, we learned that the first key to a truly positive self-esteem is a healthy positional esteem, is what we called it. We've got to have a healthy understanding of who we are uh, in the eyes of Christ, uh, who we are uh, in the eyes of the King. And, we, and what we learned was that the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, has done a number of things. He has personally called us into His presence. He's given us a new beginning. Uh, he has adopted us into His family as sons and daughters. He has elevated us to the highest possible position within His kingdom, join heirs with Himself. And finally we saw that the King holds us there continually. That is our position as believers. And I feel this morning that if we truly embrace our new identity in Christ, it can do nothing but build our self-esteem. Uh, we need to always keep that in the forefronts of our minds. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the second key to a positive self-esteem, and that is we must have a healthy grace esteem. Uh, like Paul, we must understand and tap into the power of God's grace. And we learned that grace has a three-pronged effect in the life of a believer. It provides us with lasting endurance for the race that we're running. Secondly, it infuses us with supernatural strength. And finally, God's grace makes us kingdom strong. And I think those two are extremely important truths if we're going to maintain a positive outlook and a positive self-esteem, especially during the trials and tribulations of life. Now today we're going to come to the third key to a positive self-esteem and we're calling it a healthy God esteem. A healthy God esteem. We must have a healthy perspective of who God is and what He's promising to each and every one of us here as believers. Now I think we would all agree this morning that oftentimes what drives our low self-esteem is doubt. It's doubt. Doubt is one of those things that if left unchecked in our lives can absolutely cripple us as believers. Oftentimes, I think, and you would agree this morning, we, we doubt who we are. We, we doubt our abilities. We doubt what God is calling us to do. We even doubt God himself, don't we? We all struggle with doubt. And if left unaddressed, it leaves us wondering aimlessly about with nothing more than a, a low self-esteem, a, a total lack of confidence because we're doubting. Now, I think there's various factors that contribute to our self-doubt, and those factors are, are endless this morning. For some of us, we doubt today because of life's circumstances, what, what uh, life has dealt us. Uh, we doubt today because of our past mistakes. You know, we're hung up on our past. We, we doubt because of our social status within the community or, or lack thereof. For others of you here this morning, you, you doubt because of anxiety and depression. It's a constant fight, and you're constantly doubting because of it. Some of you this morning doubt because you're suffering from a physical condition or, or a physical illness. And there are others here today, I think, that doubt uh, because you perceive yourself as being weak in one area of your life or another. But regardless of what it is, this doubt leads us to low self-esteem. Now the question before us today is how does God respond to this doubt? How does God combat low self-esteem and build a person's confidence? Well, this morning I want to take you through a number of examples found in the Scriptures. And I want us to, to take you through these examples because I want us to see that God always responds... He always responds to a person's doubt and to a person's low self-esteem exactly the same way. In each of these examples, we're going to see individuals who are doubting themselves and doubting their abilities and, and doubting what God is calling them to do. And we're going to see that each time the Lord responds the exact same way. 
And you're going to see this morning that he doesn't lavish upon them compliments and and trying to, to say, don't think such things about yourself. You're also going to see that he doesn't point out their positive qualities in an attempt to overshadow their negative qualities. That's what we tend to do, don't we? When someone with low self-esteem or low confidence comes to us, we we try to point out the positive in an attempt to, to drown out the negative. But that's not what the Lord does. His approach is different. What the Lord does is he points them to himself. He points them to himself. He gets their focus off of who they are and redirects it squarely upon him. And in each instance, he comforts them with the same phrase and the same truth. And I find that remarkable. Throughout all of Scripture, he always responds to doubt and low self-esteem exactly the same way. And this morning, I want us to begin with Moses. Now, you all know the account of God calling Moses from the burning bush there in the wilderness. And how when, and when Moses heard that voice, he drew near and the Lord commanded him to take off his shoes because the ground in which he was on was holy ground. And it was holy ground because he was in the presence of a holy God. But listen again to what the Lord says to Moses beginning in Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. We're told, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, a large land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, there, now, therefore. He says, come, Moses. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, who am I? Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of, a, out of Egypt? And God said, say it with me, certainly I will be with you. So here we find God calling Moses to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt. What an incredible honor. What an incredible honor that has been tasked to Moses. But Moses responds by saying, who am I to do this great thing? And if you read on in chapter 4 of the book of Exodus, Moses says, I can't do this, number one, because the people won't listen to me. And number two, I can't do it because I'm not an eloquent speaker. I have a speaking disability. I have trouble articulating my thoughts. He basically says, Lord, uh, public speaking is not my thing. It's not my thing. So obviously Moses has some self-esteem issues, some some self-esteem issues that are driven by doubt. Now how does the Lord respond to him? Does Does he lavish compliments upon him? Pointing out his good qualities, trying to outweigh his bad? No, he doesn't even answer the question. He doesn't even acknowledge the question, but but rather he says, certainly I will be with you. Certainly I will be with you. The Lord redirects Moses' focus. Moses' focus was on the wrong thing. It was on himself. And again, I've I've mentioned it multiple times throughout this study, the problem with our low self-esteem is we're too focused on ourselves. We're too focused on ourselves. And that focus drives us down. And God, knowing that to be the problem, gets Moses' eyes off of his own deficiencies. He he gets his eyes off of his own failures and shortcomings and redirects Moses to him. He says, certainly, I will be with you. Take Gideon, for example, this morning. Gideon was a young man who lived through the oppressive reign of the Medians. We're told in the book of Judges that during this seven-year reign, all the people of Israel fled to the mountains and caves trying to escape persecution. And each year the people would come out and they would, would sow their crops and, and plant their, their fields. However, every harvest season, the, the medians would come and destroy all that they had. And as a result, the people were starving. They were doing anything they could to survive. And, and God saw their suffering. And, and once again, he appoints a man, a man by the name of Gideon. Listen to what we're told in Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. We're told, and there came an angel of the Lord. Now let's stop right there. 
Anytime you see that phrase or that title, the angel of the Lord, it's typically Christ in the Old Testament. This is Christ before he came to the world. So here's Christ. And he sat under an oak which was in Ophrah and, and that pertained to Joash the Eberzite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress and hid it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us unto the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon on him and, and said, Go in thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, say it with me, Surely I will be with thee. Surely I will be with thee. Here we find the Lord calling Gideon to fight on behalf of the nation of Israel, the whole nation. Again, a, an incredible honor. But did you notice how Gideon responded? He responded by saying, my, my family's poor. I have nothing to offer. I'm the least in my family. I'm a nobody, Gideon says. I'm a nobody. The circumstances of life combined with his low social standing within his own family had, had drained Gideon's self-esteem. He no longer believed in himself. But again, how does the Lord respond? He responds by saying, surely I will be with you. Again, the problem with Gideon's self-esteem was that he was focused on himself. Too focused on himself. And again, the, the Lord responds by redirecting that focus to him. Take the prophet Jeremiah this morning. Listen to his response when God called him to be his mouthpiece to the nation of Israel. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before they came forth from the womb, I sanctified thee. The Lord says to Jeremiah, I formed you, and I sanctified you before you was ever born for this task. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said Jeremiah, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I have sent thee, and whatsoever I command thee, that shalt thou speak. Be not afraid of their faces. Again, say it with me. For I am with thee. I am with thee. God called Jeremiah to be a spokesman, an incredible privilege. But Jeremiah says, I can't speak on your behalf. I'm just a child. I'm too young. I don't have the ability. I don't have the experience it takes to do what you're asking me to do. Jeremiah's focused on his own deficiencies, his, his own weaknesses. Like Moses and Gideon, he's, he's doubting himself. And again, the Lord responds by saying, Your age, your inexperience has nothing to do with your calling. Get your eyes off yourself and gaze upon me because I'm with you. I'm with you. Are you starting to get the picture this morning? I am with you. The cure for low self-esteem and doubt is getting our eyes off of ourselves and, and getting, getting fixated upon the Lord and the promise that he's making. Now how about the New Testament this morning? Does God change how he combats low self-esteem from, from the old to the new? Well, listen to what we're told here in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 16. Now, let me kind of set the stage for you here. Jesus has died on the cross. The resurrection has taken place. Uh, the disciples have seen him time and time again over these last few days. And, and Jesus has asked the disciples to, to meet him there on top of the mountain. And we're told here in verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. You see that? Let's stop right there. Some worshiped, but others doubted. We're told here on this occasion that the disciples are split into to two different groups. 
Now the question today is why is some of these 11 men doubting? Are they doubting that this is actually Jesus Christ? No. He's manifested, it, manifested himself to them on multiple occasions. I think what they're doubting here is what Christ is calling them to do. They know at this point that Jesus is going to ascend back to heaven and take his rightful place there on the right hand of the Father. And he's asking each one of them to be his hands and feet. He's asking them to take the gospel to the nations. And as a result, they're doubting their calling. Now I also want you to notice this morning that when you're doubting, you're not worshiping. Do you see it? When you're doubting, you're not worshiping. Last week we saw that, that true worship involves living out the Word of God in our lives. We saw that true worship involves getting rid of the sin, revolving our, resolving our grievances with one another, granting forgiveness. True worship involves celebrating Jesus Christ, and not only celebrating Christ, but celebrating one another. We are His body this morning. But true worship also involves getting rid of the doubt. When you're doubting yourself, when you're doubting your, your ministry, when you're doubting your calling, you're not worshiping God. You can't doubt and worship at the same time. And Jesus, speaking to all of them, says there in, in verse 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And look again. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Here in the New Testament, again, we find God combating doubt and low self-esteem the exact same way he did in the Old. Redirecting the disciples' attention and focus from themselves to Him and His promises. God never changes this morning, church. Never changes. And the cure to a low self-esteem is always the same, redirecting our focus to God Almighty. But what does God mean this morning when He says, I am with you? What is God promising you this morning? What is He trying to relay to you? Well, I think it's two things. First, God is saying, I'm going to be present. I'm going to be present in your lives. He's promising us that He's not going to be a deadbeat dad or, or an absentee father. We saw last week that the Lord is a spirit, which means that He can be in all places at all times, and that includes right by your side, regardless of what you're going through. He's always right there beside of you. Now, who is this God who is walking with us? Well, it would take all of eternity to answer that question, wouldn't it? But listen to what we're told in Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 1. We're told, but now saith the Lord that created thee. Now let's stop. Who is this that's walking beside you? Your creator. Your creator. And he says, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Who is this that's walking beside of us? Our redeemer. Our redeemer this morning. Now listen to this here in verse 2. When thou pass through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overtake thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Who is this that's walking with us? He's our protector, isn't he? He's our protector. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Who is this? Thy Savior, Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us. That's who's with us. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopian Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore I will give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. The great I am is with you this morning, church. I am is with you. That should be an encouragement to each of us this morning, regardless of, of what we're facing, that the great I am is with us. Our Creator, our Redeemer, our, our Protector, our Savior, walking with us every step of the way. But notice that He's not only present this morning, He's active in our lives. Listen to what we're told in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. The Lord says, Fear not, for I am with thee. There again, the phrase. 
Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with thy right hand of my righteousness. The Lord says, I'm with you. And this is what I'm doing. I'm giving you strength. Those times when you feel as if your strength is failing, I, I'm there making you strong. He says, I, I'm helping you. I'm your advocate. I'm in your corner fighting for you. Regardless of what the world throws against you. Even when you're unaware of my presence, I'm fighting for you. And finally, he says, I'm upholding you. When you feel as if you're too weak to take another step or when life has completely overwhelmed you, the Lord says, I'm upholding you with my strong right arm. The Lord's active in our lives. He's giving us strength. He's helping us. He's upholding us. Even when the wind's been knocked out of our sails. That should comfort us this morning, I think. That's what he did for this ragtag group of misfits known as the disciples. He done those things throughout his ministry. Isn't that what he did for Peter on the Sea of Galilee this morning? You know the story. The disciples are at sea. Jesus is in the mountain praying. A great storm has, has moved in. The, the ship is tossing, or the wind's tossing the ship back and forth. And, and we're told beginning in Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. We're told, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter answering him said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? The Lord was with Peter. He was present and he was active in his life that day. When Peter began to sink, he cried out to, to Jesus and the Lord helped him. He upheld him with his strong right hand. He gave him strength to walk on the water. God did for Peter exactly what he said he would do way back in Isaiah. He did the same thing. He never fails. He, he always holds true to his word. And I think this right here in the book of Matthew is a picture of our self-esteem this morning. When we focus on ourselves and focus on our circumstances, our self-esteem begins to sink, begins to plummet. Did you notice that it was when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus that he began to sink? He began to sink when he started focusing on his surroundings and the circumstances rather than focusing on Christ. But Jesus grabs, his, grabs him by the hand, and when he does that, Peter's focus returns to God. He's looking Jesus square in the eyes, and his doubt begins to fade away. His, his lack of confidence fades away, and he begins to, to, to grow. He begins to walk on the water again. This is the truth that the Lord would have us to see and understand this morning. That our doubt and our low self-esteem can only be remedied by turning our focus upon the face of God. This is what he's promising each and every one of us. The Lord is promising you this morning, I am with you. I am with you. Just like I was with Moses and, and Gideon and Jeremiah and the disciples, I'm with you. Because the Lord was with Moses, he led an entire nation out of captivity. Because the Lord was with Gideon, he defeated an entire army with 300 men. Because the Lord was with Jeremiah, he preached the gospel to an entire nation. And because the Lord was with the disciples, these 11 men turned the world upside down. And this morning I wonder, I wonder what God could do in your life if you would just stop focusing on yourself and focusing on Him. I wonder this morning, I only wonder what God could do in the life of this church if we had stopped doubting and, and start worshiping. I wonder this morning, I only wonder what God could do. Let us pray.
Father God, we come to you today, Lord, and this is something we all struggle with. Lord, it's just constant, Lord, doubting ourselves, doubting who we are in you, doubting because of the mistakes we make on a daily basis. Lord, we doubt our faith. We doubt who you are. We doubt it all, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we just get our eyes off of ourselves, Lord, and our self-centeredness and gaze upon you and grab hold of these promises that you're promising every man, woman, and child here this morning that you are with us, that you are with us. Lord, I know you're working in the hearts of many people here this morning. Lord, you've been asking many to do something. And Lord, they're doubting. They're doubting what you're calling them to do. Lord, I pray this morning that they'd step boldly out upon the water, fix their eyes upon you, and just see what you can do in their lives. Lord, I just thank you for every man and woman, every child here today. Lord, I pray that you would just build us up. Lord, help us to, to not get distracted by the things of the world and help us to stay focused on you. Lord, I just thank you for this time together. Lord, I ask these things in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask that we stand this morning. We're going to give a song of invitation. If you're here today and the Lord's been asking you to do something, act on what he's asking you to do. Whatever it may be, whether it's the call to some ministry, whether it's time to accept him as Lord and Savior, maybe even join the church, whatever it may be, the altar's open as we listen to the song of invitation.